What do men really feel about sex and about themselves? How do men stop themselves from feeling pleasure? And what does it take for a man to get out of his head and into his body? Today's speaker, with decades of teaching and training experience in sexology and sex coaching, will explain. Welcome to the Men in Love series. I'm your host, Dr. Erica Goodstone. In this event, you will hear from thought leaders on the forefront of knowledge and experience about men and love. And today I'm delighted to be speaking with Dr. Patty Britton. We met decades ago in New York City, and I think it was before you started your coaching program. So I would love, I to, so. hear, <laughs> I'd love to hear about your background and what led you as a to become a clinical sexologist and to create your amazing training program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Erica. It's so wonderful to be here. And I love talking about men's sexuality. And, you know, it's so interesting. I'm going to jump in and give you an insight that I have as I look at the global perspectives as someone who is the founder of Sex Coaching through SexCoachU.com, our online training institution. We're now training people in over 49 countries in Puerto Rico, and I see these trends as I speak. And so many of our students and graduates are women who say, I don't want to work with men. And um, I wow. feel so, okay, I feel that there is such a lack in terms of the care and the understanding and the positioning of how we really can serve men, how we can empower men around overcoming those hurdles that they themselves sometimes impose in their expectations to perform instead of show up for pleasure, the things that you were saying at the very top of this show. And, and also their expectations that they should be with the most beautiful woman, <laughs> a model or an actress, yes. even if they really don't want someone who's out in the limelight and they really want a partner that's caring. Well, I have so much compassion for my male clients, and that's really where I was heading, is that I think that men really are given the short shrift in terms of the care, sexological care and treatment and coaching that's out in the marketplace today. And for me, I earned my PhD in human sexuality in 1993, and I had already been a working expert in the field of sexology, working at CECAS, the Sex Information and Education Council of the U.S., at National Planned Parenthood, at other agencies. And I had also been trained in sex therapy and sexuality education models. And for me, thinking about working with real human beings, one-on-one -on -one in that dynamic of the therapy or treatment room, it just seemed to me that sex therapy in the training that I received at the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality and elsewhere didn't really fit. And so for me, I love the marriage of sexology, which is understanding what people do sexually and how they think and feel about it with coaching as a modality. And so I founded Sex Coaching to really marry the two and allow men and women and anyone who needs that kind of support to work through their obstacles, to look at where they are right now and move toward their stated goals, toward the future. And pleasure and empowerment really are the two focal points. And right. I think that men don't have so much permission to experience their own fulfillment and their own pleasure. There's so much kind of locked into, am I doing a good job? I mean, we're from New York. I so know. I remember Ed Koch, the mayor, he used to have this phrase, he'd say, how am I doing? <laughs> and, and that's what men do. They say, how am I doing? Am I doing a good no, job? No, they also, they have two sides. They say, how am I doing? Or they don't care at all. That's true. Just <laughs> That's true. Total <laughs> selfishness. They're but being would... selfish in the in the negative way because I actually promote being selfish. Right. And I think that there is a, a curative aspect to being selfish, and I see that with men in particular. If they're not understanding that they need to receive pleasure from the pleasure they are giving to a partner or to themselves, then they're really not going to have successful sex. Right. Right, and they also don't think of the touch part as yes. part of the sexuality. They're not getting the touch pleasure. Well, I also see for many men that 
they're starving for touch, especially single men. And I'm going to take a leap of faith here. And I'm going to say that a lot of the coupled men that I work with, I see so many couples who are locked in the pandemic of the sexless relationship or sexless marriage, as we used to call it. And they're really touch deprived. Mm -hmm. And that need for human touch is really intrinsic to being alive and thriving, whether we're an infant or we're 65 years old. Absolutely. And I, you know, I see that men and women, but I, I actually feel very strongly that men are not given enough permission to express their unique wants and needs, and especially their longing for touch. And that sometimes that longing for touch or that Asking for touch or going for touch becomes misperceived as being aggressive or as being self-referential, meaning that they're not really exchanging the energy of touch, which is what touch really promotes in us, but they're being a pig. And I see that's <laughs> just so not the case. And also they may be touching because they really want to touch, but, but they get aroused and they want sex. True. And the girlfriend or wife isn't in the mood. So she gets afraid of the touch. Absolutely. Well, I don't know if you know, but in, in one of my books, The Art of Sex Coaching, and actually in a prior book, The Idiot's Guide to Sensual Massage, I talk about what I created as the touch continuum. And I believe, and I see it, I witness it every time I work with a client, especially around touch issues, that there are actually five types or five levels of touch. And it begins with healing touch, and it then moves to a different escalation of touch ending at sexual touch. And in between are these real gray zones that become very treacherous territory for partners. Because when we touch someone, we actually are sending a message. We're sending a touch intention message. Sometimes that message is, I love you, or I just want a hug. I need nurturance. But sometimes it's, I really want to get in bed with you and get off. And which is fine. They're all fine. But I think we're so we're so compromised as humans about our ability and our comfort in talking about sex that touch related to sex, especially when we're touching sexual body parts or we're evoking erotic energy or sexual energy of arousal, then we really can get in in very muddied waters and the communication isn't clean or clear. And that's why what happens is what you said. You know, she, let's say she's a lawyer and he's a house husband, for want of a better metaphor, and he's doing the dishes and he's standing at the sink and she comes home from her legal office, very intense day, and she goes and she grabs his butt and he says, no, not now, can't you see I'm doing the dishes? <laughs> or you can flip the gender roles. <laughs> and, you know, and I love flipping them. I and know. So it's just... We're just so deprived of good ways of letting each other know what it is that not only do we want, but what it is that we need. And I think that men and women actually are more similar than they're dissimilar. Don't you agree? I agree. And there's too many differences being put upon us. Yes. Aside from the brains, that's a whole other controversial <laughs> story. <laughs> so tell us what your sex coaching system is like and how does it work? Well, it's very much a collaborative journey with a client, and sometimes that journey takes a long time. I've worked with people over years, and usually it's very brief. It's very much like narrative therapy in a way, where we're talk only, and in the work that I do, it's talk only, and neck up, and... It also involves looking at the goals of a client, moving them past what I call the roadblocks. And I have many techniques and many systems that I use that I've created and that I train professionals about how they can implement those around the world. But I, I feel very strongly that the, the base and the foundation for our work is really allowing a person to know who are you truly? Who are you authentically as a sexual being? We are born sexual. We go to our death sexual. It's not a phase of life. It's essential and intrinsic to who we are as humans. And I love to be able to help my clients peel off the layers of the crust, so to speak, that block them from thriving, that block them from expressing who they truly are, whatever their issues are. You know, it could be for men erectile dysfunction or erectile difficulties, as I prefer to call it, because sex coaching coaching and clinical sexology as well, sex coaching be a derivative of that, 
is really a depathologizing sex positive empowerment based model. We like to look at the full human and our potential as humans, as sexual humans. And in order to do that, we really need to look at every aspect of who we are and all of the parts of ourselves that may be getting in the way, the mind being one of the huge culprits, because, you know, men are. I would say that probably 95% or more of all of the men I've ever worked with as clients suffer from performance anxiety, which means this is where they are. They're stuck neck up thinking and telling themselves things that allow them to get stuck in this mental realm and not experience the pleasure of their body and And not be there for sex. And there's a man that I interviewed on my radio show who talked about having the best sex of his life after he had a prostectomy and was completely impotent. That it was the first time, and he tried a pump and he tried things so they had intercourse, but he found that without worrying about it and not caring, they had the best sexual connection. And this was a man talking about it. Wow, that's so touching. Not too many men would feel that way. But no, they would, they, feel a, they would feel a loss and right. anxiety about not being able to, that P word, perform. Because that's for, what gets men in trouble. But for women, sometimes they're happier that way, depending on what's going on with her, especially as we age. And it's so interesting. In some ways, what you're alluding to is how sensate focus, which is one of the tried and true traditional methodologies in sex therapy and sex counseling and education and coaching, How that works is taking sexual intercourse off the table and actually getting the focus on connection, getting the focus on those those kinds of touch and connecting at the physical and other levels where we begin at the basics again. And I, I have so many couples that I work with, and I see this with men in particular who don't kiss. And they don't want to kiss. They don't feel competent to kiss. We're not even talking about penile function. I'm talking about lips here, okay? This is really basic, simple stuff. And how Well, you know, in some ways, out. kissing can be more intimate. Well, many people do report that kissing is far more intimate than sexual penetration. And, and it depends on the person. I always meet the client where they're at. So I would never impose my values about which is more intimate or which isn't more intimate. But I think men get scared. I think men get scared. They're, they're caught in this duality of the bravado of being the man. But at the same time, they're vulnerable and they're fragile on the inside. And it's like a mollusk. And that inside tissue, that soft tissue, soft never being a good word when we talk about male sexuality, I know. (laughs) But when we talk about that inner self, that softness, that vulnerable self, that's what a lot of women are really looking for in a very strong man. That's where the turn on often lies. But you have to, as the man, convince her that you are the man. You have exactly. to be the man. I always First say, you have to be, yeah. me, Tarzan, you, Jane. We all kind of want that. And yeah, then when you see him as that. Tarzan, then he can be allowed to have the soft side. But yeah. you have to have that feeling that he's the man, that he would want to protect you and take care of you. That's well, important. I think that is part of, in many ways, I think there is a lot of scripting around what you just said. And I think we have to be careful about the hyperbole of male versus female or man, woman scripts. And so I'm I'm very careful about that and not constructing that, but actually deconstructing what my clients bring in as their own metaphoric scripts for who they are. I even ask in my intake, if you were an animal, what animal would you identify with? Because I do a very elaborate intake process of not just sexual history and relationship history and medical history to a point, but also a sense I want to get to know who is that essential sexual self. You brought up a really important point that I'm generalizing about men and women, and there are so many variations absolutely among all of us yeah absolutely and you know what i love about sex coaching is that sex coaching as opposed to therapy doesn't go into you and your story as a disorder or as a dysfunction or as a mental health issue that's diagnosable and treatable 
And many of us who work as sex coaches, of course, don't take insurance, which I also see as a trend among my dear colleagues, many of whom are very well-renowned sex therapists and sexologists who don't take insurance either. And that, in a way, frees us to not have to land on a diagnostic code and say, well, you have a disease or you have a disorder. Mm -hmm. And I think men and women, but we're really talking to and about men, need to be very careful about what they tell themselves. One of my favorite mentors and just interviewed his wife on our radio show at theboomdoctors.com is Albert Ellis, who d died recently, several years ago, and was a treasure in our field. And he used to say, you know, what are you telling yourself? And I, I implement that kind of philosophy when I'm working with men and women, but men in particular. I say, well, what are you telling yourself? I once had a guy who was 30 years old, who was very successful in business and had a absent sex life and was dying of loneliness and of decline in his self-esteem and his sexual self-confidence because he was a rapid ejaculator and because his goal was to become the sex god of the universe. Right. And it took a lot of work <laughs> to, to honor him for who he was and what how he, how he was metaphorically describing his goal and kind of bring him back to reality a little bit and work on that earlier rapid ejaculation tendency and pattern with the tools that I teach and then help him to look at like you were saying earlier what might be reality for you? Right, <laughs> what does that mean, sex god? And what do you really want? And I guess I'm going to go back to my, my mollusk analogy and say, you know, outside of that, I want to be the sex god of the universe. I want every woman I have sex with to say he was the best in the world. Right. Okay, let's come on back down to earth. And let's talk about what is really going to nurture and nourish and feed you. Where's that need coming from? What's really going on? And how can we help you be all that you can be and have a great experience? And do you want a relationship? Because I think that for some men, sex equals relationship. And we have to help pull that apart as well and say, sex for sex sake is fine. If that's what you're going for. If you want a relationship, wow, now we're in a new landscape, right? It's a whole different ball game. Right. And I don't hear too many people separating that out. That's pretty important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I do with my clients all the time. So you have some kind of model that you work with, uh, M-E-B-E-S. I so do. Tell us what this is. I do. So when I was in, in uh, the early 1990s, when I was formulating sex coaching, I realized that even though I use one of the models that I'm sure you use and many of your guests on this amazing summit use, which is the Plicit model, the P being permission giving to our clients. That's the biggest thing we can do for our clients is normalize and validate and give them permission. But I came up with a model because I wanted to look at the parts of the sexual self. How are we made up? What is it that either we can look at as a clinician with our client and say, looks like you're stuck or blocked here. Or how can I create some antidotes for where you're stuck or blocked, which I, as a coach, call action steps. We devise action plans, not treatment. And we do assessment, not, not diagnoses as sex coaches. And the MEEPS model is very simply the mind, the emotions, the body, and the body image and its behaviors, energy, and spirit. And I was just talking to one of my new students from Auckland, New Zealand today, who comes out of a wonderfully positive and powerful sex education background and works with men and women in the adult toy industry. And she said, you know, I'm so hungry to learn about a holistic way to work with clients. And I love the Meebs model because it has energy and spirit in it. It's almost half of the way we have to deconstruct what may be working or not working for our clients. So I look at those five parts and I like to use it as a circle or a wheel. I don't have an image right now, but on my website at drpattybritton.com, under my coaching menu bar, I have how I work very well laid out with visuals. So anyone who's interested in that can take a look. But I think it's so important that we understand that what we're thinking or what we're emotionally feeling or how we regard our body or what our body does or isn't doing for us 
that we wish it were or wish it weren't. And energy, that energy that runs everything. So many here. people somehow leave out the body and the energy, and they talk. <laughs> And then oh, even no. therapists talking from the mind, the mind and the emotions. I know. <laughs> and don't even think about what is the body doing? How is it reacting? Thank you. Because to me, when I'm a sexologist, I'm not a mental health practitioner. I'm a holistic practitioner, but I come from sexology. We have a different filter that we wear. And I think that's why our work is so effective and why so much therapy uh, to be honest, isn't effective when we're looking at sexuality concerns. I don't know if you know, but 98% of all of my clients were referred to me by their psychotherapist because oh. I don't take new clients unless they're a referral. I refer them to my protégés around the world and I'm too busy. So when I think about that, I, I'm flattered and I'm honored that my clients come from their therapist because their therapist trusts me and they're working on the neck up stuff, right? They're working on the mind. They're but there is other stuff that needed to be worked on. There Absolutely. issues, their family stuff. Totally. A person has to be ready to be coached or to work in a sexological model. However, to ignore the sexuality, to ignore the body and not want to discuss it is cutting out to me the center of it. And that's why those of us who work with sexuality have to be schooled or trained. We have to be knowledgeable and skilled and comfortable to even have a conversation about the clitoris or the penis or whatever proclivities somebody has sexual preferences or taste. In including their orientation, including their fantasies and desires. I mean, it's a huge conversation. Talking about and helping people resolve sexual roadblocks is not easy or simple. It's very multi-layered and complex. So talk about some of the roadblocks that people have. Well, I think the biggest roadblock that I see for men is the, I think we've alluded to it in this conversation a little earlier, but it's the combination of unrealistic or idealistic expectations and performance-driven self-talk. I should be. I can't. Oh, no. I'm going to come. <laughs> uh, you know, oh, no. I hope I get an erection. It's the oh, knowing that goes on, N-O, apostrophe I-N-G, not K-N-O-W, that really stops men from experiencing not only their capacity in the body, because when they leave the body where um, I'm assuming if we're talking about arousal, it's occurring in the body. It may begin in the mind, but it's certainly occurring in the body. And when the male leaves the body and he goes upstairs above the neck to analyze or look at himself, which we call, as you know, spectatoring, or he's anxious about performance instead of being present in the experience, sex mm -hmm. fails. So in the Meebs model, for example, what you tell yourself is in the mental realm. And we, I have techniques that I teach the male clients and train my professionals to work with their clients around that help reverse negative self-talk, that reframe and reconstruct the models of thought that men are carrying, like I want to be the sex god of the universe, which is a wonderful goal if you have the capacity for right. that. And not but everybody I, does. I don't really even know how to define that because that would probably be a 600 page book to define what that really means and years of work with that individual. Also, the emotions. And maybe very young age with lots of hormones flowing. Absolutely, a 17-year-old. Um, but really, I think part of the issue is how, how men learn how to be sexual. And if we look at the trends today that are really impeding men from their pleasure and their success, I'm going to call it very coachy, but also from experiencing their own full capacity to be sexual beings, a lot of it is because too many men are really spending too much time sitting at a computer like you and I are doing right now, looking at images like you and I are doing right now, having a conversation, only they're not having a conversation. They're using one hand <laughs> to flip the switch and the other to masturbate. 
Now, I'm a proponent of masturbation, in fact, as, an, as a pathway to being skilled as a lover sexually. I know you know and many of your guests on this summit know that masturbation becomes the foundation. It's a laboratory. It's also the foundation for all partner sex. So masturbation is a healthy, normal, natural part of sexual expression. It's even its own outlet. But the reality is if we're habituating, if men are habituating to escaping connectivity with a partner or habituating to a method of self-pleasuring, quote, masturbation, that is disconnected, disembodied, and disenfranchised from real human touch, and something's going to go wrong. And also requiring more and more stimulation, more and more unusual stimulation. True. Like what we, see, we see an escalation effect in the literature that what was arousing Tuesday is no longer arousing on Wednesday. And in part, it's because it really is a starvation model. It's not a full human model. This is the problem today. And unfortunately, why porn works is because it's non-pressured, non-demand sexual release. Mm -hmm. And it's a stress management mechanism for so many men. And it's an alternative to having to show up and be present with a partner. And this is the tragedy that I see. I see that we are nurturing, only not in a nurturing way, but we're nurturing, meaning we're growing up boys to become men who are so disconnected, who are so disembodied from others. And our clinical rooms are going to be full for years because of this phenomenon. And I'm and not because they don't remain happy like that. They start to feel like something. They, they don't. And, you know, there's a wonderful film. And um, I tell my men about this all the time, Don John, which was a, a wonderful depiction of what happens to men who compulsively masturbate. I don't use the terms addiction. I'm not a fan of those terms. Right. Uh, but I use compulsivity as the model or out of control behaviors, a la Doug Braun Harvey, who wrote one of the best treatment manuals on it. And the reality is that when men are compulsively operating in this way, they're, they're really not even connected to themselves in the moment. And it becomes an escape valve and it becomes something other than sex. And, and it's hard for them to come back. And in that movie, Don John, it's such a beautiful illustration of how powerful the lure is of leaving the bedroom with a, a, a fully human woman, human being next to him and not being able to sustain his connection with her or have pleasure. And, and this is happening in American and non-American bedrooms frequently and at really greater and greater levels as we speak. And I think this is an area where men really need to wake up and understand that they need to get offline, they need to learn their own body patterns, and they need to learn how to connect and how to get in touch with their own body by breathing into their bodies, by being embodied and going neck down, et cetera. So you have a term for what you're just saying, sexual self-realization. Yeah, I do. Becoming fully who you can be as a sexual person. And I, I like that because as a student of Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of human needs, self-realization is the pinnacle of human life. And at the foundation, believe it or not, for those of you who may have studied Maslow, actually sex is part of our essential needs as human animals with shelter, with food, with water. And, and it was stunning for me to, when I, when I found that, I was like, yes, of course. <laughs> really, as sexual beings, we need to emerge and we need to evolve. We need to clear away the baggage, clear away what stops us to be fully who we can be and experience the joy of that. Wow, beautiful. So what tips and suggestions can you offer? Well, you know, we've talked a little bit about selfishness and being trained. And one of my gurus was Thomas Leonard, who is the founder of coaching as we know it today, life coaching and personal coaching, and then many other derivatives. And he, in one of his books, wrote about the power and the importance of being selfish. And I'm really big on that. And I believe that selfish is a positive term. And that being selfish means I have to take care of me first. 
I have to get my stuff handled <laughs> before I can really show up to be with someone else. And so being selfish in that way is important. And there's another aspect to it, something we talked about earlier, which is being able to receive pleasure from giving pleasure. Because this is one of the foundational tenets of the methodology known as sensate focus. And so when men touch someone to give him or her pleasure, there is a loop of energy that needs to come back so that as he's giving pleasure, he's also receiving pleasure. And another tip is... Well, he has to be able to receive it because if he's not receiving... He has to be able to receive it. If he's not yeah. receiving that sense of pleasure, it feels like work. Absolutely. And then he'll get angry. And we know what happens when that happens. Um, and then another tip is if you're heterosexual and in a sexual relationship with a woman, take care of her first. Pleasure her first. One of my favorite programs that I made for LovingSex.com is the Modern Kama Sutra three-part program. And the second part of it, which was a DVD, it's now all streaming, of course. DVDs are obsolete. But it was called Pleasure Her First. And that's a key, guys. If you take care of her needs, if you allow her to experience her first amazing orgasm, then you can take your time and have your way and have a really wonderful time. And last, my last tip is I want you to go neck down. I want you to get out of the neck up zone and I want you to become present. Go inside and feel the glorious pleasure that your body can provide for you. <laughs> there you go. So simple, but I know, not easy. It can but take simple. quite a while to experience that but there is it can. It can. you're available and you talk about your training program and what you offer to people yeah and i i really this is my life's work i've been doing this over 40 years and it is my passion and it evokes my compassion so i'm i'm thrilled to be your guest and i invite anyone who's interested in doing this work to check out sexcoachletteru.com visit me at my site drpattybritton.com and um we just opened a new site called sexologyu.com training professionals who are looking for the sexological parts but really already have the clinical skills base so we're out there in the world doing what we do and loving it and training more and more people to meet the needs of men around the world. Wow. And you also have a free report. I do. I do. I have a book on the secrets of how to turn her on. <laughs> that pleasure her first is called for her pleasure. And that is an ebook that I created as a result of making that Kama Sutra program. And it's a beautiful little self-help guide for kind of the secrets of what women need and what they love and what they want and how to provide that for them. So I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. So the women of the world will love hearing yeah. <laughs> that their yeah. man They'll is appreciate it. Part. They definitely will. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing your you know, vast knowledge and understanding sure. about what really goes on with men. Yeah. In sexuality. I send my love out to all you men. You deserve the best. And thank you, Erica. Thank you for participating in this series. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And to those of you listening, I look forward to speaking to you again soon.